Seven Blue Skies Channel presents a remastered recording of Paranormal, Book One, Parts One and Two, Legend of the Vampire's Blood, by Dr. Ahmed Khalid Taufiq. Introduction. Let me introduce myself to you. I am Dr. Rifat Ismail, retired hematologist and professor in one of Egypt's universities and in a fair number of universities in Europe and the States. My age is about 70, single because my raucous life never left me a chance to be like others, and I have seen a lot. I have opened Count Dracula's coffin. I fought the werewolf in Romania. I searched for Loch Ness Monster in Scotland. I met the abominable snowman in Tibet, and I followed on the call of the demon caller in the dark cornfields in Egypt, and I have known the zombie in Jamaica. All this I will tell you in detail in this book series, but I ask that those of you with weak nerves and sensitive emotions not read this, and that is to save yourselves hours of fear, horror, and being scared of the dark. Today I tell you my story on The Legend of the Vampire's Blood. 1. Night of Terror I was at this time a young man of 35 and knew nothing about the world of the paranormal. I had a belief that science had already dis discovered everything. Of course, I was naive. I traveled to England to attend a conference on blood diseases attended by renowned and respectable doctors the world over. But, as we know, lectures are not as interesting as they may seem, and I had spent that day the blackest four hours of my life listening to a lot of talk about blood cancer, pernicious anemia, and, and. The doctors in attendance had become already bored miserable, and with blocked thoughts, which I prefer to call the dumbfounded conference. They had lost all feeling in their backs and limbs, and their butts had melded into parts of the chairs on which they sat. Some of them were spending the time whispering to each other with their hands over their mouths, like students in school. And finally, the lecturer said, thank you. For a second, those miserable attendees could not believe their ears, but the man had really finished his long lecture. Hence started the sighs of relief from the listeners, and they started clapping for him in thanks. The lecturer was a handsome old man named Richard Cummings. I met him in Egypt more than once, and I was amazed by him so much. He was an imposing and majestic figure, a nervous type, passionate about history and art and in love with pharaonic history, which was the common interest we shared. After the lecture, I met him, and he warmly welcomed me directly with happiness on his face. He even shook my hand, which is not customary amongst the Brits. He asked me what I thought of his lecture, so I politely lied to him, saying, It was awesome. He invited me to his country house in Yorkshire, because I am, like he said, a cultured man with loyalty to science. Therefore, like the firm British customs taught me, you see me entering the garden gate of his nice house at exactly seven o'clock in the evening. The moonlight was throwing soft, tender rays on the lovely ivy descending from the sloped roof. In the garden, I smelled unfamiliar scents of flowers, the names of which I did not know. And inside, the house was elegant and simple, the house of a pious Catholic family. In the living room, there were loads of crosses and a big painting of the Last Supper. His wife was middle-aged, polite, and kind. As for his daughter, Catherine, she was a teenager, but more mature than her years. And I realized how pious they were when they prayed at the dinner table, which made me feel self-reproach because I had forgotten to ask God's blessing in his name before eating. I mumbled, in the name of the merciful, the most merciful, and started filling my stomach from the various gorgeous-looking yet awful-tasting food which the British kitchen is known for in all of Europe. After dinner, and in the comfortable setting of the living room, Dr. Richard sat next to the fireplace, smoking his pipe while drinking his coffee with content, and it seemed to us both that life could not get any better than in this moment. Dr. Richard asked, How do you feel being from the dynasty of those amazing pharaohs, those geniuses? I smiled. I didn't know how to reply, so I mumbled, Remorse and regret, because I didn't study their civilization and all they have discovered said Dr. Richard. Sometimes it seems to me like there is nothing more to be discovered after all that has been discovered up to today. I think the era of discovery is gone and the era of innovation has started. And here starts the role of a man of science like me, 
who believes in the paranormal and believes that every myth has an origin beyond where the earlier tellers had stopped. Therefore, we open new doors. He looked around the empty room and then whispered, Check this out, the myth of Count Dracula. Nobody had tried to contemplate it. They were studying electricity, electromagnetic fields, the splitting of the atom, and antibiotics, so they never paused at this myth. Here comes the role for a scientist like myself who believes that the myth doesn't just appear out of the void and stops at it for a moment. There are historical scenes that are a bit suspicious, the blood, this weird red liquid that symbolizes life and death together. Consider the rituals of drinking blood in India, the mummies with the long nails found in China, the feast tables of the Spartans at which they drank blood mixed with vinegar and spices, the blood of the sea turtle that the Jamaicans drank to cure rheumatism, the medieval magic and witchcraft books which all speak about vanquishing vampires as if it were a given. And here we start with open minds to confirm that at some time, in some place, existed nightmarish creatures who live in blood, like Dracula. Oh, that was Catherine's voice, she having just entered the room and hearing the last sentence. Quickly, she asked to be excused to her own room. Dr. Richard said, This is better. There are things that men shouldn't say in front of women. You understand me. He went to the light switch and turned it off, so the room became dark, but for the dim light of the fireplace, as he said in a touching and dramatic way, this way the atmosphere is suitable for these horrifying conversations. I felt shaken, with chills up and down my spine, and the flame from the fireplace reminded me of the trip I had to take back to my hotel, the cold and the fear. Dr. Richard stopped, looking at one of the hung paintings shadowed by the dancing flames of the fire, and he whispered, I have searched and searched for long years with a friend of mine, an historian, and today I can say that we have confirmed with solid proof that Count Dracula exists. His nightmarish words echoed, and I shook in my chair. As a matter of fact, Dr. Richard was an amazing theatrical director. The story that all people know is the story of this Count who lived in Transylvania in the 14th century. He was evil with all that the word carries, but he was not one of the living dead except that a prolific writer gave him the name Dracula, meaning the devil. He was immortalized by Bram Stoker in his famous novel that people are still shaken by today. Then, the international cinema, Vincent Price and Lon Channing. He sighed and then continued, Today I say that Dracula really existed, as the novels portrayed him, without any exaggeration. 2. The Count's Servant I said with interest, but we are both men of science, and we both know that what we can't see, hear, smell, or logicalize simply does not exist. Confidently smiling, Dr. Richard went to a corner of the room, to a cabinet, opened a drawer, and withdrew a large file, which he handed to me, saying, Read these papers before you speak of science. Before I replied, Mrs. Cummings entered with a smile and in English that I tried to make sophisticated, I thanked her for dinner. Then we started conversing about the weather, and I complimented them on their house and expressed how I liked the painting of the Last Supper. She started explaining to me the story behind the painting, and the look of surprise on Jesus' apostles' faces, and so on. She said, Do you know why Europeans are ominous about spilling salt on the table? I shook my head, conf confessing my ignorance. She said, because Judas, the traitor, is in the picture and had spilled salt on the table in front of him. You see his face? That is the face on which is drawn all of human sins. He was obedient to the devil. He couldn't find another path, so he surrendered. At this moment, I had gone into the world of the painting, but I was still thinking of the long distance that separated me from my warm bed and reading this envelope I held. When I went back to the hotel, I lay in bed and reached for the envelope Dr. Richards had given me. It was filled with old papers and photos. One of the pictures was of an old, strange-looking palace, another picture of a sealed marble coffin, and afterwards a picture of something I could not make out, and next a picture of a tall, bearded man and a yellowed, fragile paper containing a map drawn with black ink an unknown palace with many underground tunnels named with Slavic names that I couldn't even pronounce. Lots of mysteries. Finally, a paper in English in Dr. Richard's handwriting which said, 
We have searched for months in the tunnels of Count Dracula's palace in Transylvania, to which the touristic police had stopped tours as the house was largely decrepit. And finally, we found the attached map which led us to a tunnel filled with dust and bats, holding the Count's family's coffins. We opened all the coffins until we found the Count's mummy, and on its chest we found an ivory box. Inside this box was a letter written by the Count's servant for the generations to come. I write this message to warn those who come after me of a heinous danger. The devil had chosen this miserable spot as his cradle. Dracula is the first-born vampire in this country. My master, the Count, is known amongst the villagers to be cruel and a tyrant. He hired mercenaries to enforce his power and authority. All of this made them call him the Devilish, or Dracula. The Count started every night to drink a damned mix of pig's blood, wine, and spices, with the claim that it restores youth. And he started studying black magic and became ever more strange and isolated. His face grew longer, and his voice resembled the howling wolves on the full moon nights. He would go out in the night and come back at dawn, isolating himself alone in the basement of the palace. He even stopped eating altogether. In the black magic books, I found an explanation of his status. The mix he would drink leads to immortality in the most horrible way. It turns the drinker into a human bat. It feeds on human's blood at night and sleeps in a coffin during the daytime and will die if it sees the sunlight. And I had to know. Next morning, I gathered my courage and went to the basement of the palace where his family coffins lay. It was filled with a stench and mice were freely playing. In a marble coffin, I found what I was looking for. Then, in an unclear part of the letter, it continued. And it doesn't breathe, and its face is so pale, as pale as dead people. And on his lips are drops of undried blood, and his eyes are open, staring at nothing. I got, got closer to his lips and gathered my nerves, and when I opened its mouth, I found two rows of teeth, organized and pointed, like the teeth of predators. I freaked out, the kind of horror that paralyzes the brain. So I ran. I had only one thought in my mind controlling me, escape. I ran like mad, not knowing to where, and I even forgot to close the coffin. So the Count has become a vampire. He had become a threat to himself and others. The villagers were reasonable in making the sign of the cross whenever they passed by his palace. That was the secret of the old beggar's corpse they found near the palace. In his neck there were two red puncture marks, and therefore the Count removed the sheer curtains and any relics, and there was howling that shook the palace on the moonlit nights, and therefore, and therefore. I returned to the black magic books to read more. This vampire is a nightmare, and it's my duty to find a cure to end this nightmare, especially since it had not yet sucked my blood, maybe because it needed me. Killing a vampire is an easy thing, for it will die from any religious symbol. It is a symbolic creature. Its existence is symbolic, and its killing is done by symbols, the light, the color white, silver, and religious books. All of these kill it. But the effective way is the wooden stake to the heart, and then reading upon it the last rites. The books warned, too, that just as the vampire's existence is symbolic, its death is also symbolic and it comes back every century to wreak havoc upon the earth. And after it spreads horror and death, it gets killed by the hands of an untainted person. And, and here, I felt something abnormal in the room. I raised my head and saw Count Dracula standing above me, blocking the door, sneering at me. The night has come to me unawares, and when it awoke, it found that its coffin was open. The Count realized that I understood now. I looked at him in horror. His face was unlike any I knew. Horrible fangs, his skin pale and wrinkled, the smell of sulfur, which all the black magic books spoke of. He moved in front of the mirror, yet he had no reflection. Even the candle left no shadow on the wall. I screamed, my God, save me. Stunned, he backed up for a moment, and I ran like never before in my life, making a mad dash for the door back to my room. I closed and locked the door with the key. I reached the bed and promptly blacked out. The last thing I saw was movement of the doorknob, but the door was locked. Yes, the Count is the devil's descendant on earth. 
He is sick and he knows it, and I decided to put him out of his misery. I will kill him today. All of the black magic books foretell that he will be killed by an untainted person. I am this person. I am the judge, jury, and executioner. I will go down to him with the silver dagger and wooden stakes and, above all, my faith. And if I were tainted and met my demise, then whoever finds this message would know what I knew and await the return of the count after the passage of a hundred years. Let the righteous one amongst us have the victory. Signed, the servant of the count, Jessup Michael, in the year of our Lord, 1559. At the end of the message, I found a small comment in Dr. Richard's handwriting saying that they had found the Count's mummy, and on his chest this warning for the next generation, which means that the servant had succeeded in his message. The diaries had ended. I turned off the bedside lamp and closed my eyes to finally relax them in the darkness. Well then, so this is the nonsense that busies the renowned scientist's mind? Just a bunch of dumb talk that fills the cheap horror flicks about the Indians and the Spartans and the Chinese mummies? It's all just nonsense. And so I went on amusing myself, imagining all the different shapes of evil in the world. The red-eyed ghoul, the octopus with six arms. No, I couldn't. For a reason I was unable to grasp, I couldn't shake the image of Judas in da Vinci's painting. The look of a miserable sinner who submits to his sin. I don't know when or how I faded into a deep sleep. 3. The Mummy The next day, at the conclusion of the scheduled conference, I met Dr. Richard in the cafeteria. He was sipping his coffee and smoking. I greeted him, and it seemed to me like last night was just a silly fluke, far removed. Dr. Richard stirred the cream on the surface of his coffee and asked me, Did you read the papers? I answered, Yes. And what did you think? I told him honestly my opinion on the whole matter. His eyes flashed with anger. He put his cup on the table and said, Nonsense? You think I, and one of the best historians in Europe, fell victim to a dirty trick by someone trying to be funny? Okay, so this funny man put himself through all this trouble and prepped these papers and prepped the mummy and waited for years until it crossed an idiot's mind, like myself, to search in this tunnel? What a joke. I said, There's nothing that proves my opinion, but also nothing that refutes it. He shook his head, upset, but then went back to his usual innate calmness and said, There is something I want you to see. I want you to come to me tonight, same time. There is a new thing I want you to see. Once again at the dinner table, I sat across from Judas's sinful gaze. On the other side of the table sat a professor named Max Lubreski, who is, as you guessed, a Jew. He didn't stop for a second regaling us with how much he suffered in the Nazis' concentration camps. Why did God create scientists so boring to this extent? After dinner, Dr. Richard turned to me and said, What I'm going to show you now is the extract of years of research by myself and Mr. Lubereski. But I don't ask that you be convinced. I just require, and it is my right, that you be respectful of what you will see. Add to this that it is a secret that must stay concealed. He said the last sentence with a fearful tone while stressing on the words, must stay. I felt timid and said, I promise you that. I rose with them and we went to the basement, the elegant English house's basement with the smell of preserved alcohol and a rotten stench and the smell of something I couldn't place. The doctor lifted the tarp off of a box, opening it, and said in a theatrical way, Gentlemen, I present to you Count Dracula's mummy. It is fair to say I did not feel scared or wondrous. I simply maintain the detached look of a scientist who doesn't get surprised at anything, yet is interested in it. It was an ordinary mummy, having the same advantages and disadvantages as any other mummy. Eaten skin, scattered strands of hair, a hook nose. Only one thing was different, the teeth. Why were there, in the mouth, these sharp fangs similar to wolves' teeth? Dr. Richard Cummings smiled gloatingly and whispered, What do you think? I didn't reply. Instead, I asked Lubereski, How did you get the mummy here? He replied, We managed to smuggle it out in a complicated way as a cargo of dip digging equipment, and the Transylvanian authorities don't even know it is here, and therefore did not look for it. Dr. Richard lit a match close to the mummy, and it extinguished suddenly. He said, Do you see? 
there is inert gas coming out of this mummy. I could not swallow all of this, but it was the reality. In front of me now, living proof of the mistaken scientific assumptions, the existence of magic, and the probability that all these myths could be true. I asked Dr. Richard, but why are you spending all this time and effort? He said, for the truth, and he said it simply and continued. Tr the truth that will give science immeasurable flexibility, enough to encompass the creeds, myths, and beliefs of ancient civilizations and bring about unprecedented change in the world. We stand now in front of living proof of the existence of black magic. After a few minutes, we went up to the living room and sat silently amidst a group of old documents. I said, I still don't get it. Why tell me, especially, these things? He said, because you're a Muslim, Dr. Rifat. I replied, yes. And he said, and I'm a Catholic, and Lubareski is Jewish, and that will make the witnesses of this miracle from three different religions. I said, what miracle? And he replied, the miracle of the return of Count Dracula.